Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Catherine Perry, the Executive Director of Leadership Winston-Salem, and I'd like to welcome you all to our November installment of Leaders and Lunch. Uh, we have a super impressive panel today, and we will get to them in just a moment. I have a few short announcements. Uh, first of all, we've had a lot of fantastic uh, events in November. Uh, for our alumni and the community to engage in. And our next event after this one is going to be the Big Chat, which is an opportunity for Leadership Winston-Salem, the Central Library, and Muse Winston-Salem to work together to create a conversation around gun violence. We will have representatives from the Winston-Salem Police Department, uh, the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, and a few members of our community that have been directly impacted by gun violence. Uh, we'd love for you to come out and uh, take part in that conversation. It will be at the Central Library this Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. And Jared, if you would put the link to register for that in the chat, that would be great. If you're interested in attending, click on that link and register for that opportunity. I'd also like to announce uh, we have hired recently our newest member of the Leadership Winston-Salem team, Thurman Tolan, who is a graduate of the class of 2019, will be serving as our alumni engagement coordinator. So you will be hearing a lot from him in the coming weeks and months. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our conversation facilitator moderator, Randy Wooden. Randy? All right. Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate it. And uh, welcome to the uh, the attendees. We're going to have a great discussion today. And uh, before we uh, get into the discussion, I'd like to briefly introduce our four panelists and uh, by mostly just by title and organization and then invite each of them to share a little bit more about uh, what they do um, and, and really what their part in today's discussion will, will take, um, take form. So let's start with David Barksdale, CEO of Piedmont Federal Savings Bank. There's David. Uh, Barbara Maida Stoli. President, CEO of Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina. Also, Brittany Nelson. Brittany is the regional property manager for Grub Properties. And Mark Owens, President, CEO of Greater Winston Salem Inc. And again, my name is Randy Wooden. I'm with, well, Barbara's organization, Goodwill Industries, Northwest North Carolina, and director for our professional center. And I might add, class of 2022, the best class ever. Anyway, let's get things started. We're going to talk about, we've got some issues that I think everybody is aware that it's tough to find workers these days, it's tough to find them, tough to keep them, and that transcends industry, function, you name it. And it's not just here in the, the, the Winston area, this is nationally. It's a tough labor market right now, tough to find folks. But at the same time, we're also seeing apartments going up, houses, and and we'll get more info on this from, from Brittany. I mean, we're at, what, 90 95% occupancy rate in a lot of these cases. So on the one hand, we can't find people. On the other hand, where are these people coming from that are occupying these new dwellings? We're going to kind of peel back some layers on that. We'll get into some topics uh, to include housing and where are these workers coming from. We'll talk in a you know, gosh, we'll talk all kinds of things today, but uh, we're going to get it started, first of all, with with David. And if you would fill us in a little bit more about what you do over there, will you? I sure will. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Barksdale with Piedmont Federal uh, Savings Bank, and I apologize. I've, I've lost my voice uh, spending some time in the cold Saturday night and yelling at the referees at the uh, Wake Forest game. Uh, kind of blew my voice out. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be on mute when I'm not talking, and y'all have to yell at me that I'm on mute uh, when it's my turn. Um, you know, at, at Piedmont Federal, we've been here in Winston-Salem. Next year, we'll celebrate 120 years. Uh, so we predate the merger, uh, the merger of Winston and Salem. And our role really is, is as a mutual bank. Um, we are owned by our uh, depositors, by our customers. And so we are, the, I believe, one of the truest forms of community banking um, here in Winston-Salem. And we're about housing. We're a mortgage banker. And so we want to figure out how we can uh, get folks in housing and, and really talking about affordable housing, not affordable renting. And there's a spot for affordable renting. We certainly need that. Um, but then once you transition out of the, the rental world, you know, how do you get into the housing world? One of the things that we've been working on is small dollar mortgages. You know, how do you incent uh, mortgage loan officers who predominantly are paid on commission uh, to go after small dollar mortgage loans? And, and that's an area of concern. Um, our mortgage bankers are all on salary, so they get paid the same whether they're working on a $100,000 loan or a million dollar loan. And we think that's uh, part of the solution. But together, we've got to figure out how we solve uh, the small dollar mortgage loan piece so that we can help this affordable housing area. 
Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Barbara, um, a little bit more about what you do with Goodwill. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Barbara made a stoli, um, with uh, Goodwill Northwest North Carolina and um, the work shortage and, and uh, what we're speaking about today is, is truly where Goodwill Industries um, really focus in our communities. You may have shopped and donated at any one of our 51 stores here in um, Northwest North Carolina, um, but you also may have shopped in other locations around um, the country as well. So what you may not know is what we do with the items that we sell and the monies that we earn from those dollars um, that we earn in the stores and the, the items that you donate. We fund employment and train training opportunities and programs that help people find hope and opportunities and jobs. Um, we have enabled and served more than 38,000 um, people across our territory last year uh, through partnerships with employers, uh, community colleges, NC Works, um, just to name a few. Um, not only are we partners and our partners are impacted by this workforce shortage, we are too. Uh, we're a very large employer of 1,100 team members across our 31 um, county territory, we also are impact, impacted by that uh, workforce shortage. So um, glad to be with you all today. Thank you, Barbara. Appreciate it. Brittany? Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Nelson, Regional Property Manager with Grub Properties. Um, I have been in the multifamily property management sector for about 19 years, um, four years, which have been with Grub Properties. Um, while I do have an opportunity to serve other communities outside of the Winston-Salem market, I currently oversee operations as it relates to our three downtown communities, Link Apartments, Brookstown, Link Apartments Innovation Quarter, and our new um, build, Link Apartments 4th Street. Um, overseeing the operations kind of keeps me abreast of the ins and outs of our resident demographics, market trends, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm kind of here to, to just give feedback on where our residents are coming from, where they're going to. Um, and that one element of affordable housing and essential housing, you know, Grub Properties is unique in the way that, you know, we have our investor relations, we have our fundraising, we have our construction, we have our development. Um, and then we have me, you know, on the operations side and kind of how all that comes together to build a project to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the community and meeting the needs of the individuals inside of the community. So that's actually what I'm here to talk about today and answer those questions. Sounds good. Mark Owens, you're up. Hello, everyone. Excited for the conversation. CEO of Greater Winston-Salem, Inc. We help recruit companies to move here, help the existing companies stay and grow and add jobs and help all of our small businesses stay open and thrive as best they can. Uh, I'll be short so we can get to the meat of the program. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mark. And again, a reminder, if you have comments and questions, we'll try to get to those at the end and put them in the Q&A so uh, we can keep an eye on that. But let's let's dive in. First off, we'll, we'll tackle the worker side. So where where are the workers? And I guess let's let's just tee this up and you guys can jump in as, as you see led. Uh, we always ask if you'd like to say something, just kind of raise your finger and that'll alert everybody else that you've got something to say. But what are employers at this point really doing to find and retain workers? Are they doing anything different maybe than they did a couple of years ago? What does that look like uh, from the employer side? Yeah, Barbara. So from the employer side, I think that we probably need to just baseline um, the labor shortage and, and kind of put it in perspective first and foremost. Um, there are 2.9 million fewer Americans that are working today compared to February, 2020. Um, there are 10 million job openings today, but there's only 5.8 million unemployed workers. So with the demographic drought, what we have found is um, early retirement, baby boomers, a slower birth rate, and we've seen um, COVID impact and substance abuse impact and the constant turnover that we're seeing today. So I thought it would be important just to kind of level the, the labor shortage as employers are looking for uh, em employees. There are fewer workers to be had 
uh, in the industry. Hey, Barbara, where do you think that is concentrated from a Winston-Salem for Scythe County standpoint? What are the industries that are really struggling to find those? Sure. Uh, out there? Sure. Um, mainly healthcare, technology, and construction, transportation, and logistics are the largest industries that are being impacted by the labor shortage. <laughs> You know, even yeah. for us in our industry, you know, hiring service workers, maintenance workers, the trades, um, when it comes to the construction, I mean, the turnover for trying to get a project managed, I mean, even as simple as getting an apartment turned with painters mm -hmm. and workers and stuff like that, that is something that um, we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. And just the trade workers alone, um, there aren't a lot of those to come by. Are you finding, are you finding that increasing compensation helps uh does are, are other benefits i mean what what would attract and, and moreover retain people because once you get them it's it's a whole lot more expensive to go get new ones you want to keep the ones you have that are performing you yep. know and it's interesting that you pose that question you know a lot of it is about the mm -hmm. the monetary amount you know what we're paying hourly what we're paying based on a salary but you hear a lot from the new generation of the workforce coming in. It's about company mm -hmm. culture. What are we offering them from a relationship standpoint? What are we giving back to the community and how can they give back to the community? And that's something at Grub Properties that we've remained pretty focused on, right, is the building of the culture, but also the monetary amount. Everybody is looking for workers right now. So, you know, it is their, their environment. They can pick and choose who they want to work for, what's going to be the best one. Mark. Uh, yeah, Barbara. It, just to add to that, um, Brittany, um, what we have seen and learned is that meeting people where they are is the most important piece of retention, um, meeting their flexibility, helping them with child care, um, being flexible with their schedules um, is, is key also to uh, the generation and, and the expectations of flexibility for the workforce. And I, think that's, I think that's um, a, a great point, Barbara. Mm -hmm. But as you know, as, as bankers, and I saw uh, mm -hmm. Greg Barber on here, another banker, that you mm -hmm. know, those of us that are running retail outlets, so th there's no such thing as often a flexible schedule. I mean, we got to be open from eight thirty to five o'clock or whatever the hours are. And mm -hmm. um, certainly, our support teams we can offer flexibility, but it is mm -hmm. a challenge, particularly in this inflationary environment, to offer the, the flexible schedule that, that many folks are demanding. It is so true. And what we have found is we have, what we found is if we can offer four hour blocks for, for part-time uh, work, uh, what we've learned as well is in the gig economy, um, gig employees are, would prefer multiple part-time work, not in congruent industries. So they have the flexibility of working a four hour block in a service industry and or another industry to be able to be flexible with their family. So that's another option to take a look at as well. Mm -hmm. Mark, I was gonna ask you, do you, you know, as you look at recruiting or, or you know, having companies come to the area, I'm sure that's a, a, a big topic is, hey, you guys have any workers there? Uh, how do you address that? Yeah, it's a great conversation. I was kind of listening to everybody's perspective too. It, it is on top of mind. I think it is, as Barbara said, to kind of level set a little bit, some just some data points for you just to share. Winston-Salem's population rate over the last 10 years is 9.1%. The state of North Carolina is 9.5% 9, 9 and the United States national rate is seven. So we're growing faster than the national rate. You're seeing that in the Southeast, you're seeing average ages change, you're seeing a lot of different things. So we're talking about the, the work remote, um, hospitality tourism hit really hard during the pandemic. A lot of our industrial manufacturers are fighting over, you know, 10 cents to 20 cents more and an, av an hour is causing people to move. Our unemployment rate as of last month is 3.8%. That's pre-pandemic. I mean, that is, that's a big deal. It's great that we're back to that, but it really speaks to the exiting of the workforce more than it does the total number of jobs available. Even though the jobs continue to grow up, go, we've had over 750 jobs announced um, just from economic recruitment in the last, you know, 14 months. So one thing I did want to just say is, you know, we think about it from a, 
workforce population standpoint and, and do it by percentages, 62% of the civilian workforce in Forsyth County, 62% of the population are in the workforce in Forsyth County. In Mecklenburg County, 70%, Wake County, 70%, Guilford, 64%. So it's workforce participation is a major, a major issue. So our companies that are coming here, where they're coming from is worse than where we are. So I'm not saying we don't have issues. We're not perfect. We got work to do in Winston-Salem with that in Forsyth County, without a doubt. But when you look at where companies are coming from, the Northeast, we've had a few from New York, had a few from major metropolitan cities, the available availability of workforce in Forsyth County is still better than some other areas. But that is, you know, it's, I would say, Barbara, you mentioned kind of, and Brittany mentioned generational demands. Uh, it's really across all generations, people wanting the remote. At the, we're competing with life now, right? A, a good example, we had an event the other day, it was Monday at three o'clock, and we had individuals that had kids t-ball and softball games on Mondays at three o'clock. And that didn't happen before COVID, to be honest. That was later, or that just wasn't a part of it. And so now you're starting to see that the, the life balance, which I think is healthy, but it's mm -hmm. also starting to take away from individuals that have to be working in person too. So it's it's really interesting to see the population growth continuing to choose Winston-Salem for South County for that quality of life. But how do we continue to get people back in the workforce is gonna be really important. I wonder too, now you see uh, where folks can work remotely. Um, and and so why would I wanna live in, let's say a Chicago, New York, LA, where the cost of living is sky high? When I can do the same work remotely from a place like Winston, cost of living, amenities, it's, it's a sweet spot to be. Are you seeing, a, uh, I guess, an incoming uh, flow of those types of workers? Anybody? Yeah. I would Pretty, say, I don't know. Yeah. I would say anecdotally, and I think you can yeah. probably see that from probably what Brittany's group is doing too. You're mm -hmm. seeing the rise in downtown apartments and people wanting to live mm -hmm. in a community for that quality of life. Mm -hmm. Our cost of living is at 90%, meaning we're 10% cheaper than the national average in Forsyth County. And so you, you, we don't like to say we're cheap. We have high value proposition, right? So we are more cost effective, but you mm -hmm. see the increase over 5,500 units downtown now. That's been in, in, an enormous increase. The occupancy, Brittany can share probably a really high, but you're seeing that. You're seeing people want to come back. Our average age in Winston-Salem is 38. So you're seeing people that are coming, maybe putting roots down a little bit more established in their careers and, and looking to either raise a family, as David said, buy that first home, buy that second home, whatever that is, and put the roots down. So I do think we're seeing that influx. My favorite stat, and I'll be done and hand it to Brittany, is that the last quarter we had more people move into Forsyth County from Mecklenburg County. So more people moved to Winston from Charlotte then people in Winston moved to Charlotte. So mm -hmm. that's a big win. I like to be a little competitive. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah, um, yeah, so as it as it relates to kind of who's coming in, you know, you mentioned the remote workers and, and we do have some of those, but it's more like the hybrid when it comes to our remote workers. It are It's the big corporations like your Haynes Brands, your, your Inmar, those sort of places where, uh, it, RJR is a prime example where, you know, they're working from home maybe two to three days a week and they're in the office the other portion of the time. So it is more hybrid with what we're seeing on our properties. You know, we have the three deals in downtown Winston-Salem and they're all kind of in their own little market. So you have the Link Brookstown on the west side that's closer to the hospital. You have those residents, those fellows, the nurses, like the administrative staff from the hospital. I mean, a majority of that makeup of that demographic at Link Brookstown is really going to be like your, your hospital and your medical and your frontline workers. And then you take it all the way over to Innovation Quarter where Link Apartments Innovation Quarter sits. And you have a lot of, we do have a high level of entrepreneurs, right? Like they want to come to Winston-Salem. We have their creative minds in the building. They are very unique individuals. We have those researchers, but also Innovation Quarter is unique because we have 60 to 70% of that building are the students. We have, you know, Winston-Salem State, North Carolina School of the Arts, and of course the medical students right across the street. Um, and mixed into that is 
the empty nesters who some of them are the parents of these students. Um, they are coming, they wanna live in that same building that's very unique. Um, we have some that just want to live that urban lifestyle. Um, they want to be downtown. It's an intergenerational mix um, at Innovation Quarter. Uh, it's a really cool building. If you can visit, I definitely encourage you to. And then we have 4th Street. 4th um, Street, we just opened our doors in July. 4th Street is right in the middle of it all, right? We're right across from the chamber. You know, we're in the middle of the arts district. Um, so we're still building out that demographic and for lack of better words, that vibe. Like what is 4th Street going to be? Um, and I'll get into this later probably, but 4th Street has that AMI and the affordable and essential housing element to it as well because we've partnered with the city of Winston-Salem. So we are serving different dynamics of the community at each um, property. And it's what can we do to give back and continue meeting the needs of the community and the people coming in. So mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of who's coming in. And we do still have people leaving. There are still people that are seeking home ownership. The rental is just kind of a stepping stone. And then they kind of go to David to, to get to that portion of the, their journey. So I'm gonna hand it off to David. Well, you know, talking about downtown first, um, I, I got buddies that come back from for Wake Forest football games and homecomings, et cetera, and they, they can't recognize downtown Winston-Salem. And thanks to Grubb and, and, the, and the work that Chamber has done, I mean, the, the stuff that's going on in downtown, I'm one of those. I'm, I'm quasi-empty nester. I still have a couple of them hanging around, but we moved to a downtown condo because I like breweries and live music, and I'd rather be right there at it than, than in the suburbs at this point in my life. But, you know, you do – there's a role for the downtown living and the and folks that are getting their first role, they're the entrepreneurs. And then you're right, they do want to go into housing. And and most of those tend to be concentrated outside of downtown. And, and we'll, we'll certainly play that role. I do believe though there's a role for for downtown housing. I'm I'm, I'm in a condo, so it's that's that's debt. I get to get a mortgage on that. And, and I do believe when we go in, when we transition into affordable housing, Randy, and on how we bridge that gap, particularly east of 52. And, and how we get more folks in houses that are close to their work. Because it, it's, you know, if you don't have good reliable transportation and you got great affordable housing and it's 20 miles from your work, getting to work is a problem. And so you can't put them in affordable housing that they don't have transportation to their place of, of work. Excellent. Yeah. And we will get to uh, affordable housing and and uh, later on here in our discussion. Let's pivot. Unless you've got anybody else want to chime in on anything dealing with who's coming and the why behind it at all. Okay. All right. Yeah, Barbara. Yeah. I would just, you know, I wanted to piggyback on Mark's comment around the 62% of workforce participation mm -hmm. in, in um, Winston. And, and this, this parlays across the territory in the country um, is the skills gap, right? Is the, we have uh, not enough people in the pipeline um, so there's limited people in the pipeline to work. And then in the high demand industries, transportation, um, healthcare, manufacturing technology, there's a skills gap. Um, so we are working on educating students and families um, on the awareness gap of credentialing versus degrees, not getting away from a four-year degree or a two-year degree, but complementing that, that education with a credential or going to, through a credential and then a four-year degree or a two-year degree, which we have seen that create some upward mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a CDL driver um, could be credentialed, work in transportation logistic and make a hundred plus dollars a year. Um, so in the healthcare industry, we're seeing the need, um, any healthcare um, folks that are on the call are probably shaking their heads yes for for um CN, cns and cmas and um, rns it's just it's really tough market in the healthcare industry right now so the skills gap is always is also a very i think mm -hmm. a, a large contributor for um some of the participation of work you're even seeing that too Brittany. i guess when you talk about some of the skilled trades that will come in and help put the finishing touches on on some of your construction um it's got to be a challenge that's right yeah it's one area for us you know from the service side and even like the vendor side it is an area that is a missed opportunity right now yes 
And I think also, too, and of course, Barbara and I are reading off the same hymnal here. Um, we realize that, uh, you know, we train for X, but X is no longer, you know, I used to make eight tracks years ago or, you know, I <laughs> fix your, uh, you know, whatever. But uh, remaining competitive, you got to stay on top of things. And I think that's a partnership. And Mark, I wanted to ask you about that as far as the engagement between uh, companies and places like Goodwill for SciTech, other, you know, institutions of, of higher learning and, and trying to crank out uh, students and, and folks who have the skills that are really needed in today's market. Any thoughts? Yeah, it's definitely a partnership. And I think it's, you know, those partnerships and those resources and those offerings are needed more in times of challenging economic situations, more so than they are when times are great and there's plentiful jobs. So, it's important that those services are in place before that happens, which they are. Obviously, at Goodwill, with the as, as a board member of Goodwill, there's a lot of great programs, and Randy's program is one of the best. There's a lot of training as well, but there's also, for SciTech, has yep. really stepped up through some community leadership. The Hope and Opportunity Scholarship, Dr. Spriggs, has been able to, to situate is that every resident of Forsyth County can attend Forsyth Tech for free. What a what an advantage we have when we talk to companies and talk to people about that opportunity. For Site Tech's enrollment is up while a lot of community college enrollments are down. So they're training, they're looking at the certificates, they're looking at the associate's degrees in, in that pipeline. They've also partnered with the employers. As you mentioned, the employers have always talked about the skills gap. Right now, I'd say that the biggest challenge for employers are just getting people that will show up and be you know, reliable more so than all the skills. A lot of our employers, especially in the manufacturing side, are willing to hire and then train once they're hired versus needing the individual to be skilled from day one. So that's really interesting. The LEAP apprenticeship, learn and earn apprenticeship program has really taken off from that. Our Aspire internship program for high school students has also taken off. And then you see that through some of the American Rescue Plan Act dollars that the county has uh, provided to Greater Winston Salem Inc. for Site Tech, Goodwill, the school system, um, in the city, in in order for us all to get together and create that pipeline. I think it's really important that we don't just solve the problems for right now, but we set up the structure to look at workforce development and programming for the next five, 10, 15 years. Yeah, we'll we'll get into the benefits cliff here in just a second because that's a big one. What about uh, veterans or folks that have been involved in the uh, legal system um, you know, as far as them reentering? Work, workforce? Are you seeing any movement, any initiatives to really push to, to hire folks in those situations? I, I'll jump in on that one to start with. Yeah, the yeah. city has a program um, that Councilman James Taylor has has led and been really passionate about, done a great job as SOAR, um, reacclimating formerly incarcerated individuals. That's been fantastic. Uh, there is more um, attention and, and appreciation for our veterans uh, for, you know, we just have veterans day. I want to thank all our veterans for their service, but you know, North Carolina has a high concentration of veterans. And so activating that workforce is really important, even though we don't have a base currently here, we're within proximity for Bragg and others that we can have other veterans come and work in our, in our community. That's been an increased effort. You know, it's really also um, what I would say, what we're seeing, especially on the manufacturing industrial side is people leaving the hospitality tourism industry and going into other career paths. I think that's the biggest challenge is people exiting and then people saying, I worked at a restaurant. I'm tired of people yelling at me for refills or for getting an order, you know, late or whatever. I'm going to go work somewhere else, earn some more, have a more structured schedule, not have to work as many evenings. So I think that's interesting, but I do think any sort of reentry programs, I know Goodwill has a lot of those as well, Barbara, those are really going to be critical to get more individuals in our, our labor force participation rate back up. I would agree, Mark. And, and Goodwill has a great program, both in project reentry and our veteran services programs. Our project reentry um, program, you know, suffered during the pandemic because one of the key components of that program is to, is to go into the prisons in, in, jails um, tw 12 weeks prior to release. So having um, working one-on-one -on -one with those individuals coming out of incarcerations, including their families. And um, so we're happy to say that we're back into the prisons in the jails to be able to bring um, individuals into the communities, back into the communities. 
in a in, in much stronger way and in stepping into the workforce. Um, so those are two fantastic programs that we have that we're very, very proud of. Here's one for you. We're going to throw this one out. Barbara, you can tee this one up if you want to. Uh, the benefits, Cliff. We've talked about how maybe, okay, I'm going to bump their pay a little bit and we'll keep people. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, that's not always the equation. And let's, uh, Barbara, why don't you start this off with what is a benefits, Cliff? Sure. And so, then we'll try to figure out how to solve the world's problems here. And, oh, goodness. Well, yeah. I don't know if we have all that time in the world today <laughs> to do that, but that would be wonderful. So, the benefit cliff is, um, think about a benefit cliff that, you know, think about a bridge. You have two sides of um, uh, the street and there's a bridge in between the two sides. The cliff happens when you, is when you're starting to go across that bridge, you're earning, you're earning a, a, a wage, you earn some credentials, you start out at $15 an hour, okay? Then you get a raise, you start moving along the bridge, you're in the middle of the bridge, you're at $17 an hour. Social services at that point, some of your social services start dropping off. You get a raise far beyond what you what social services qualify for, for childcare. So say you get a dollar raise, it's $2,000 a year, but you lose $6,000 in childcare services. So you're in the middle of that bridge, that is the cliff. That's the cliff that you have that you're in to get to the other side, which is a living wage. So a mom of just some statistics, a mom of two children um, in 2020, the living wage is $42.04. So a mom of two would have to make $87,000 to be able to have a living wage at $15 at the current, you know, average rate in this community, that's that's a large leap from 15 to $42 to come off of all dependency on social services. Um, so the benefit cliff is, is a federal program. It's set up in, as a federal program. It's quite the disincentive. So what we see is mm -hmm. folks earning dollars, get a raise, they start losing so, some of their social benefits, decide to go back on social services and or not take their raise or quit their job to take a lower wage because they cannot fill the cliff. They can't fill the gap. Yeah. So that's the education piece behind it, Randy. Yeah, know what you got, Brittany. Yeah. And just a parlaying off of what Barbara just said, um, it's interesting that same gap exists with housing, right? So, you know, those individuals who are at 90% AMI or 110% AMI, those are not the individuals who have a caseworker, who have government subsidies or anything like that. Um, those are the individuals that are living paycheck to paycheck. Randy, you were about yeah, to Yeah, Brittany, what's the, what is AMI? Some people may not know what oh, AMI is. So your, your average median income, right? So um, those in our community that are making an average wage and what that median income may be, 90%, um, just give or take, is probably about $48,000, right, per year. Um, with rent increases and rent inflation that we've seen recently, those individuals are going to struggle to pay their rent. And so, you know, I, I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but Link 4th Street is a prime example of, you know, the multifamily sector, Clay coming in, working in partnership with the city of Winston-Salem to say, hey, let's make this project more affordable for us to build. Um, what can we do to give back to the community? And the city of Winston-Salem saying, hey, you know, we would love it if you would provide 25% of those units at 90% AMI so that those individuals coming in can actually like pay their rent and meet that, right? Um, and, and that's why I'm so, I'm so proud to work for Grub, right? Because they actually see that gap and it's, you know, we speak of the benefits gap and the skills gap and there's also a housing gap. Like there is a housing crisis and making sure that we're meeting the needs of those individuals who make that amount of money, so. Yeah. And we're going to pivot into the housing issue here next. But just before we do, just see if anybody had anything to add to the benefits cliff, anything that you're seeing. Are there is there movement from a government standpoint to adjust this and, and to make it 
to to create an incentive to improve? Barbara, any any ideas on that? Not from a federal yeah. standpoint at this moment. Okay. Um, I would say from an advocacy standpoint, I think as a community and as a state, we can advocate for the state um, to change some legislation around benefits that would that would help our our state. Um, okay. Anybody else on that one? Let's, all right. Well, let's let's pivot. Uh, so we've talked about workers. We can't find them, and why not? And what are we doing about it? So we've covered that. Now let's pivot to housing. And Brittany, you've touched on it, and, and David as, as well. Um, affordable housing. In fact, in the front page of the paper today, there was an article about affordable housing. And David, to your point, is it being built in proximity to where the jobs are? And and transportation issues and such. So we're going to open this one up about, we're going to talk about affordable housing. Uh, people have to live somewhere. They've got to live somewhere. Help us understand what some of these challenges are to having affordable housing for folks who may be on that lower end of the wage scale. I think the article in the paper today, Randy, points to the to how complicated this issue is. Yep. Yep. I mean, you've got uh, affordable housing coming to one of the wards uh, in our city, and the folks in that ward want it to be somewhere else in, in a more blighted area than, than where the developer proposes to put it. Um, you know, it's got to be, and, and Mark and I were talking about this um, earlier in the week when we got together to prepare for this, is it, it's got to be a community-wide effort to solve this problem. And it, it, it's got to be the governmental piece it, it, have got to make some type of incentive for the developer to go in there. Um, the business community has got to play a role in this and, and the nonprofit community has got to play a role in this. And, and if you look at it, the stats of Forsyth County and our economic mobility, we don't fare very well. Um, we are very poor and a lot of agencies have been working toward this. Housing to me is one critical element of that because that's how you get intergenerational wealth is, is through housing. And, and the, the rent part and affordable rent certainly plays a role. But if we get folks in houses where they can actually build equity and we don't have institutional buyers, nothing against institutional buyers, but they're not building sense of community. And, and I think that's a problem or could be a very big problem in, in Forsyth County is what happens when the market turns with all these institutional buyers, um, where they leave the market and put a glut of inventory. They're not kept up to the way they, they need to be. The rents start to escalate. How can we get folks in housing? And it takes some down payment assistance. It takes some creative financing. It takes developers like Grub Properties and, and Clay and the great work that he does, willing to go in and do the right thing. And, and it's gonna take all of us to figure out how we put more affordable housing units um, out there for folks to get. And I can't remember what the 14,000 units short or something like that. I don't have the, the stats in front of me, but that we've got a major shortage of getting folks in, in good housing that is close to transportation hubs so they can get to work. Yeah, and then we had uh, Mayor Joins on a show that I co-host uh, a, a few weeks back and uh, we asked him about some of the challenges in Winston and he cited that as these top Top the top challenge is affordable housing and and how do we get that and and you you uh, man you hit on a lot of points there David uh, but one thing that it kind of made me stop and think a little bit is the marriage or the relationship between government and and private funding and what role government should play. Uh, and again, there's a there's a line here, and I'm not sure where that line is. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, do we want government saying this is how it has to be? Do we want incentives uh, or just keep government out and leave it to the private sector? How, how do you see this thing uh, playing out? How should it play out, maybe? And, and Mark may be able to maybe able to help me on this, but I, I think that there's no one answer. I, okay. I don't think you can have government come in and say that this is the program. And I, I believe we have a very good city and county government mm -hmm structure here. And so I believe that allows us to look at, at a multitude of alternatives. I think flexibility is one of the keys here. I don't think that developers are going to go and, and build affordable housing and, and take a loss for it. Um, and they may do that one or two times, but they're not, they can't, that's not a sustainable model. And so it's it's got to be with some kind of either incentive or donation of land or selling land for 
50% of the value of it, that's city owned or county owned land that they maybe not need anymore. I think it's going to take some creative ways to think about how the developer can, can get in there and, and build the housing, whether that's apartments or single family housing, and, and not go into the red time and time again, because that, again, that's not a sustainable model. Mark, you don't, you may have some yeah, magic I, dust I, in your. Just wanted there. to add to, I mean, I think you're exactly right, David, our city and county, what my opinion is and what we see as best practices around the country are not when our governmental agencies are the developer, but when they help subsidize and invest with the private developer. And I can probably say that a little more directly than some of our other panelists here. But for example, you know, when, when our developers are looking at projects here, there is a range. It can be 10%. It can be 50% affordable. That range can move based off how that Excel sheet and that balance sheet needs to look so that people like David and others can loan them the dollars and have the capital investment in it. And so for our city and county to be able specifically on the affordable housing side that lives in the housing authority through the city, that city number can help really determine how many doors, as they count it, are able, able to be a part of a development. So the state of North Carolina, in my opinion, also has a really good opportunity to engage in this on a state level. A couple of quick facts. Again, owner-occupied housing percentages. Owner-occupied, which I know David is really passionate about. I am too. And I know Brittany and her team help people get to owner ownership as well. The national average for owner-occupied housing is 65%. And for Scythe County, it's 62% of individuals are owner occupied. Mecklenburg, 56%. Wake County, 51%. Guilford, 59%. So as you look at our metros, we're a little better in that percentage in terms of owner occupied housing, but the, the type of that housing, the value of that housing is a little bit lower. So that can either be cost or that can mean they're really old and need some upfit and need to be better. And that's where we need to also work on is not just the number of affordable housing units, the pathway to affordable home ownership of our higher quality product. Just a quick note on the transportation side. I think, yes, it's where you need to be located, but I also think a longer discussion would be about the transportation system and, and is that the best way? There's some interesting studies that Winston-Salem State's leading on more on-demand transportation that I am personally a big fan of. So there's a nugget for our future conversation. That's Help the next panel discussion. Yeah. What is, when, when, you, when you say on-demand transportation, what do you mean by that, uh, Mark? What's, What's that? Yeah, mean? just instead, think Uber, Lyft. Mm -hmm. You know, on-demand part does it a little bit now for companies, but instead of the hub and spoke model where you are are on a bus or transit to a transit center and then back out. Winston-Salem State study showed that the average rider for Forsyth County spends an extra seven and a half hours on the bus a week just to get to and from where they're going. That's a full day work, a full day at home, a full day doing anything else than being in route. Imagine if that was an Uber ride that took you directly to the grocery store, doctor's appointment, to place of employment. What could that look like? There are cities across the country studying that. There's some in North Carolina studying it. And I think that conversation along with the affordable housing should be had in conjunction with each other. It, it's a dual, it's a dual prong problem. And, and Craig Richardson at the Center for the Study yes. of Economic Mobility that's down CCM at Winston Salem State has done a lot of work on this. And, and 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 you can't solve housing without transportation. You can't solve transportation without solving housing. You, you, you got to tackle them both at the same time. Brittany, you had something I think you were going to throw in there. Did, did did I catch you with that? You know, no, I, the guys just like touched on literally everything, but, you know, <laughs> it does circle back to, um, you know, our investors who are coming in and, you know, putting forth the funds to build these projects. Like there is an expectation of a pro profit margin, right? You know, the Excel spreadsheet that Mark refers to um, and going to David and say, hey, lend us the money, et cetera. Um, you know, it circles back to, we don't wanna push all of that. We don't wanna push all of the costs of the construction and the development off to our residents for that profit margin. So it's finding that balancing act, right? So that it is still affordable for them. Uh, you know, Grub does a really great job of, you know, choosing where to build with some intention and with partnerships, right? Whatever those partnerships may look like, whether it's the government sector, the community sector, et cetera. Um, he looks for places that are opportunity zones where other people don't necessarily want to build. Um, and then we have this full team that just comes together from investment relations, fundraising, operations, development, 
to really have this full one-on-one -on -one immersive experience within the community. And I think that that does show some partnership and just kind of a little bit of a level of difference. Um, and we're long-term hold, right? I think Mark had mentioned this, right? Like we're not, we're not leaving the community. We're not going away. Uh, we're not gonna push rents, make money and then walk away. Uh, to make a profit, right? So it's finding those developers that are going to stay that do have the long-term hold and, and are invested in the community. Hey, by you the know, way, if anybody has, uh, just real quick, if anybody has uh, questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A and we'll work them in at the end of our program today. So yeah, David? You know, the other piece of affordability yeah. right now, and this is affordability for everybody, is uh, the interest rate environment. Um, if you bought a house uh, last year, if you bought a three hundred thousand dollar house last year and did an eighty percent mortgage on it um, at, at three and a half percent, the prevailing rate sometime uh, middle of last year. Today, that prevailing rate seven percent. You can get you a two hundred thousand dollar house, and so that and that trickles up and down the the, the scale of, of housing value. So anybody that's on the phone or that's participating is looking to sell their house. Um, that's great. But know that the replacement of that house is going to get tricky unless you're going to move in with your kids and get on their sale plan. I think you ought to do that. Um, if you can pull it off, let us know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, I wonder about how interest rate, that was one of the topics we wanted to touch on is how has that impacted the uh, thirst for or the, the, the hunger for more development? Because uh, it costs per square foot's got to go through the roof. Well, you got a yep. double, you got a double whammy there. You've got yep. uh, construction costs, which really went up with supply chain. Now those are starting to yep. abate some, but you had you had the cost going up, and now you've got the interest rates going up. And uh, the, the developer, the homeowner, whoever has got to carry that interest cost. And if you've gone from a four percent interest rate to a seven percent interest rate, well, that makes a difference, and it's going to make a difference in in the homeowner and ultimately what they can buy. And you know the trickle effect is that you know developers that were building. $750,000 homes and up have now seen their population of potential buyers shrink. And, um, you know, that uh, we, we hope everybody's still going to be okay through this economic cycle. But, you know, that's a, a warning flag on, on many of the banks is, you know, who's out there building houses that, that, that can't sell them because people can't borrow to get into them because of the rate environment. And, and it's only going to go up for the, at least the next you know, four to six months in, in, in our fuzzy crystal ball. Do you see it? Yeah. Uh, Brittany, did you want to add something to that? Yeah. I was, I was going to agree, right? The consumer price index is not really going to go down just yet. We probably have about another 90 days before CPI starts going down because, you know, what they're looking at is the in-place rents and the contract rents, which is already high, um, not the new asking rents, which we're seeing kind of drop a little bit in the market. So yeah, just uh, getting a, a reminder. If we have any questions, put them in the in the Q and A. Is that right, Catherine? Right, Q and A. Yep, put them in the Q and A so we can Q and A, not the chat. The chat's disabled. Ah, got it. Okay, well, good. Put them in the Q and A. <laughs> so interest rates. Um, it, you know, we talked about earlier. We talked about how government can get involved with incentives and you know get try to get people into home buying, David, as opposed to continuing to rent. Are we going to see additional, I don't know, incentives or help from government to help people get into these, these houses that you say maybe become unaffordable to a lot of, or they just say, look, at that end of the wage scale, you're on your own. We're more focused on the lower end of the wage scale. Yeah, that that's why I'm not an elected official is, is I have yeah. I don't know how you tackle that. I, I think yeah. the first thing you got to do is figure out how to get folks that are um, in, in more of the low to moderate income. And I hate that term, but in, into that area and how you get folks into affordable housing versus helping those that, that used to be able to afford a million dollar house. Now they can only afford a $750,000 house. I, I think that gets tricky. I mean, you know, the Fed there, now there is, you know, there, there are policies that could come through the, through the governmental side to help with interest rates or to help with the, with inflation. Um, you know, but no one wants to talk about those, especially this short after an election cycle. The Fed, they only have rates. I mean, they only have monetary policy, but they don't have fiscal policy. Um, and, and it is a blunt instrument. The only thing they can do to control inflation is to raise rates. And to Brittany's point, um, we believe that rates will, are going to continue to rise um, probably another 125 uh, basis points or 1.25 percent. Uh, before they start to uh, abate. And I'm not sure they're going to really come down much in 2023. So I think this is a problem that we're going to be looking at for the next um, 12 to 18 months 
uh, before we see any kind of relief on the interest rate side. Now, that doesn't yeah. mean that we can't come up with some programs on the on the fiscal side. But uh, again, I'm a banker, not a not a politician, not, not a politician. Hey, we're getting shorter on time. We have about, uh, what, seven, eight minutes left. Uh, I know I need to turn it back to Catherine with a, a couple, three minutes. Catherine, is that about right to give you a couple, three? So we've still got about five minutes, I think. And jump in, Catherine, if 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 I'm off on that. Is that no, about right? spot on. Okay. All right. We're still good. All right. So uh, dust off your crystal ball or your magic wand, I guess. Um, we're just kind of throw this out to see the future um, or things that you might like to see in, given a perfect world. Mark, you mentioned the, the idea about the on-demand transportation. That's an interesting topic and maybe something for another another uh, leaders in lunch. But uh, any other thoughts as, as we tackle this worker challenge and also the affordable housing challenge? And let's start, uh, I guess we'll go in alphabetical order again. So batting lead off is David Barksdale. Thank you. Um, you yeah, know, and I alluded to some of this. My, my yeah. crystal ball is just as fuzzy as everybody else's. If it were um, crystal clear, I probably wouldn't be um, a banker uh, standing here talking to y'all today. But, yeah. uh, you know, I, I do believe rates are going to continue to rise. Um, I'll hit it from the banking side. Um, we think the terminal rate for Fed funds um, is somewhere around five and a half percent. That's currently at four percent. So we do believe we've got one to one and a half percent more increases um, um, in rates. And, and we think unemployment is going to go up. Um, can we have a soft landing and avoid a recession? Um, boy, I sure hope so. But I'll tell you, it is difficult. Um, in the last six cycles of rate ha- hikes, four of them have resulted in a recession. Um, and we have the trajectory of the current rate hikes, how far they're going up, and particularly how fast they are going up, are, are unprecedented in rate hike cycles. And mm-hmm. so I, I do believe uh, hitting that soft landing is going to be difficult, which means we could have recession, which ties back into the um, employment situation and where do you find workers, and, and it's all interconnected. Um and then if I just, you know, back to my earlier point on magic wine, if I could uh, see anything, it would be some type of governmental nonprofit and business community coming together um, to help us solve affordable housing, uh, both in the transitional housing as they're first coming in and in the rental world, as well as moving into the affordable housing so that they can generate wealth and pass that on in, into the next generation and help with this economic mobility piece. Yep. Good deal. Barbara, thoughts? Sure, I do. Uh, so my, I have a wand. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so for goodwill, you know, we we want to continue our community leadership, and and we want to do that by providing equitable access and opportunity for upward mobility for our program participants and our communities and our team members. Um, by the good we do and having continual conversations with folks that are on this call today around moving uh, the needle in our communities uh, and partnerships. Um, I love what you said, David, around you know private governmental nonprofit um, collaborations. I think that's key to the success in our communities. Great deal, thank you. Brittany, how about you? Sure. Um, So I I guess as far as crystal ball, um, what I see happening, the market is definitely softening. Rents are coming down. Renewal increases are lowering. Um, For us, I think that that does look like a recession. I think it looks like, you know, the market is changing. While jobs are still strong right now, we do recognize that there is some uncertainty when it comes to the job market. So being a little bit more realistic with our renewal expectations as a company, and I think just overall, right? Um, I think for the future in a magic wand, like all of us just need to stay nimble and flexible. Um, I agree with David. I think that there is a need for the public and private sector to come together to to bridge a lot of gaps, right? Whether it's the benefit gap, the skills gap, the rental and affordable gap. Um, so I do agree with that. There needs to be some sort of collaborative effort in that regard. Got it. Thank you. And Mark, um, and we also have a couple of questions in Q&A. We want to tackle those real quick. So Mark, what you got? Yeah, I'll be I'll be quick. I, you know, yeah. I, I really think Winston-Salem for Scythe County has more upside. We have more challenges, of course, but 
you look at mid-sized cities across the United States, mid-sized cities continue to grow in population, grow in amenities, grow in just overall choice of why people want to live there. You know, I just want to encourage everybody when we talk about Winston-Salem, sometimes step outside of the snow globe we live in and go look at other places and come back and bring those ideas. And I think you'll really be encouraged knowing that we still have areas to focus on. We're not perfect. Nobody is. We got work to do. And that's why we, we focus on economic mobility, be the best place to raise a family and ultimately be the top mid-sized city in the Southeast. Those are our goals. Yeah. The job market uh, is tight, but more jobs are coming. We're not slowing down. You'll see some uh, today's Tuesday. Check the papers this week. You may hear some more news coming this week. But I, I really just want to encourage everybody. There is, there is opportunity in the job market. The benefits cliff is a real issue. And that's the challenge is where there's individuals that want to further their career, but maybe there may be some punishment financially in order to go tackle that. So talk to your local officials, talk to your state officials, or consider running for office and go change it. That'd be the best thing we could do. Got it. Hey, real quick, Mark, you want to tackle that one about uh, transportation? Sure. And we talked about cars and Lyft and Uber and transit. How does our community compare on active transportation? Uh, yeah, thank you, Carol, for asking that question. I would say that there's not really a ranking. We've looked into that. We need we have room to grow in that. Our Uber and Lyft supply is pretty short. Just try on a Saturday evening at a, at a big event downtown, the Millennium Center somewhere, and see what that looks like. Uh, that's challenging. So there's opportunities to grow there. There are other cities that are doing that and having city-owned uh, vehicles and using employees to be providing that ride share is that alternative transportation angle. So we need we need to increase our ride share component for a lot of reasons. But it's starting you're starting to see that change as people want to take control of their their own ownership of of their work. But you'll also meet a lot of Uber Lyft drivers that then go private and don't use the platform once they get their their set amount of revenue. Brittany, a quick real quick one here. What's the average rent for a one bedroom apartment in Winston? Sure. So one bedroom, you're ranging anywhere between about 1500 to about 1650, 1675. Um, I see a portion of the question is where the jobs they pay enough for the renter to afford such a place. Um, again, it's a mixed demographic, depending on where you're at. We do have the medical professionals on the Brookstown side. We have the students and, and their parental guarantors that are, you know, on the IQ side. Um, we have the recent college graduates at RJR, Haynes Brands, you know, they are doing a lot of, um, uh, resourcing for employees. So um, those are the ones that we really have, and those are the ones affording it. As far as the vacancy rates of those jobs in Winston-Salem, I can't speak to that, but Barbara might be able to. Great. Well, look, we're going to be at, we'll have to table that for another day. We're almost out of time. Again, want to thank uh, all of you for, for joining us, for the attendees as well. David, Barbara, Brittany, Mark, thank you very much. It's been very informative. Let me throw it back to our, our executive director. Catherine thank Perry. you, Randy. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists who joined us today, in addition to all of our participants who uh, found the content matter to be compelling enough to take their lunch time uh, to spend in, uh, in conversation with us. Uh, I think this was an incredibly pertinent conversation to have given uh, where we are as a community. So again, my hat's off to each of our panelists for sharing with us their expertise. Um, I would like to thank each of you. Remember that we do offer Leaders in Lunch every month, usually the second Wednesday of each month. Watch your social media stream for announcements about upcoming topics. And I'd like to wish you all a wonderful week and a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.